Participatory irrigation management has become a norm across uh, most of the globe. And this really involves bringing groups of farmers together uh, to self-manage themselves. And usually these types of self-managements uh, concern water governance, farmers coming together and cooperating on how to share water between themselves. At the same time, many of these uh, participatory irrigation uh, programs also examine how farmers can come together to cultivate different types of crops. In Tajikistan, USAID implemented a program that combined water governance with agricultural extension services. And the training that was imparted was much longer than what usually is done. This provided an opportunity for us to look at how longer training affects farmer participation in these participatory systems and whether the combination of interventions, packaged interventions that combine water governance and agricultural extension affect cropping decisions on the ground. Our research finds that longer training has a causal effect on increasing farm participation. Farmers who receive longer training are more likely to pay their financial dues, of sign water contracts, and appear in participatory meetings where key decisions on how the organization's function are made. At the same time, the packaged intervention approach, which combines water governance with agricultural extension services, provides an opportunity to fa for farmers to not only improve their production of staples, such as cotton and wheat, which have traditionally been grown in Tajikistan, but it also provides an opportunity for them to diversify into higher value crops, such as vegetables and fruits. One of the features of the water allocation decisions being made in Tajikistan is that we see water being used in very different ways on some pieces of land or for some purposes compared to others. So the newly privatized Deccan farms are using water to grow staple crops like cotton and, and wheat, whereas in kitchen gardens there's a, a move to a range of, of other crops, many of which are used for uh, home consumption, for food security, many of which are marketed. And there's thoughts about, you know, what are the markets like and can they be developed for some of these fruits and vegetables in ways that haven't been done before. When we look at the decisions that are being made on one type of farm versus the other, um, we would expect that if the land is otherwise similar and that the people's skills are otherwise similar, that they would f be making similar kinds of choices on the two pieces of, of, of land to which they have access for farming. But we don't see that. We see they're quite different. And so one might imagine that that's the most rational and sensible choice, that something about the farm being further from the household or growing crops which are better suited to a certain kind of labor might explain some part of it. But what we see is that it's hard to find clear explanations of why these patterns of production are so different. And the thought is that probably one of the patterns is better for any given household than the other one and something stopping them from making them the same. And so if they really do want to grow this many you know, vegetables and crops here, why don't they grow some of them there? And chances are it's because of their access to water, that the water access is under different rules, there's different, different laws, different, different um, ability of the, the people making these decisions to know that the water is going to be there when they need it. Improvements in uh, water management and water governance in Tajikistan have uh, contributed to better water delivery services on the ground, be it at the farms or at the gardens. And this improvement in water services is extremely important for households to cultivate both staples as well as high value crops such as vegetables and fruits. What we're finding is that the USAID approach, which combines longer training with the agricultural services, has led to improvements in both the traditional cropping system as well as the high value uh, production types of crops such as fruits and vegetables. Now most of the fruits and vegetables that are cultivated, especially on the kitchen gardens, are consumed by the household. And this is very important for the household's nutrition. So the combined approach the, of, of providing the extension services along with improvements in water governance, ha, the USAID approach, as we say, has contributed towards reducing uh, uh, mal malnourishment in southern Tajikistan, which, which is a very serious problem, uh, historically speaking. We're fortunate here to have a real-world laboratory of having actual observations on the choices people are making in this context. I want to explain why that's important. Um, as an economist, or the way many economists, not development economists, would think of this issue, they say, shouldn't this be obvious? If we can provide more water at lower cost and more reliably, shouldn't we expect to see farmers using more water? 
a shift to more crops that are they're water intensive. And from knowledge of production characteristics, we should be able to predict what the changes are in outputs and productivity. What's the challenge here? The challenge is that those kinds of approaches assume that markets are working and they assume that all else is equal. Well, what we're learning in this context is that all else isn't equal, that one of the big factors changing in the background is this migration of men away to work in another country, changing labor allocations, changing roles, changing workloads, and that has profound effects. As well, this is an environment where people aren't used to making lots of independent decisions about crop choices based on price signals. This is an area where they've been working on collective farms and following other ways of decision making. So, this, by having access to these kinds of data, uh, we can see what's really happening on the ground. In some projects or some applications, we go after data about opinions, about reactions, about how people feel about things, what their perceptions are. We have key informant interviews, we have focus groups, all of which we've done. So we've used that kind of qualitative research. But we're fortunate here to have data about the choices people are actually making. So it takes us beyond the conjecture, it takes us beyond the planning. What choices did they actually make? So we focused on things which happened over a two-year interval. We have cross-sectional data which describes what was going on initially, and then we have how did that change two years later. And so it shows us that people are actually making these choices. Uh, when you're a small holder of having three hectares or four hectares of land and you decide to move from one crop to another, even half a hectare, for you that's a really large choice. And so by having a broad representative data set uh, um, matched and, and, and carefully selected, we're able to test hypotheses, hypotheses and say, is this just some random variation or is this noise or is this an effect we're seeing across as we do, thousands of farms. And so we can test hypotheses about actual behavioral changes and say, no, this is a real thing. Diversification is happening. 